Penis, I'm gonna be on here for a little bit. If you have a question, make sure that you throw it in the comment section below and I will be sure to answer it. All right, let's talk some technique. I'm gonna help you with your forehand. When you are hitting a forehand, I want you to think of something really simple. It's called two, one, two. Take your racket, let me tilt this down a little bit more just to make sure that you can see this. It's called two, one, two. Take the racket back with two hands, hit with one, and then finish with two. So two, one, two. Now I get a lot of pushback and people saying, yeah, but Ryan, the pros don't catch the racket. They, they don't catch the racket, so I don't wanna catch the racket. Well, guess what? Catching the racket is gonna help you as a recreational tennis player. Hey, what's up, what's up? Hey, what's up, Rishi? Uh, catching the racket on the finish is gonna help you to have more consistency. See, if you play a match and you lose and you're thinking, ah, my forehand, it wasn't because you didn't hit the ball hard enough. And be sure to hit that like button, uh, uh, everybody and tennis players. Thank you so much for joining me here. We already got 15 people just in the first minute. We got 15 people hopping in here, which is awesome. Uh, ask me your tennis question and I'll be sure to answer it or I'll do my best to answer it. I'm gonna probably be live for around an hour, right? What's up, Sharon? I'm probably gonna be around uh, live for around an hour, which is really exciting. But the first tip I wanna give you here today is turn with two hands, hit with one, and finish with two. So if you have a top spin pro, you can hit like, oh, I just hit the ceiling. Let me actually choke up on my racket a little bit. That way I don't put a hole in the ceiling fan. Turn with two hands, hit with one, and catch with two. Now, when you finish, I want you to catch the racket, but you're gonna do so by waving to the opponent when you strike the ball. There is a direct correlation with the height of your non-hitting hand at contact and the level of your play. So the height of your non-hitting hand, if it's up here, you're a high-level player. If your non-hitting hand is down here, you're a low-level player, and it is that simple. If you wanna be a higher-level player, at contact, have your hand up here. This is where you see Novak Djokovic. When he is hitting a forehand, his hand is up here. You do not want your hand down. It can impede hip turn. If you're someone who hugs yourself on the forehand and you cannot turn your hips, that's a huge issue. And also it can lead to over rotation. So turn with both hands and then when you strike the ball, kind of wave to your opponent as you hit. It's a little bit of a rudder. It makes sure that you rotate, but it makes sure that, that you don't over rotate. So two and two. Hey Ryan, hey, what's up, Eric? Played at my local club yesterday. Eric was one of my premium members of my website, 2 tennisnet I played at my local club yesterday and I'm so happy you pointed out uh, the low toss on the serve. I was serving bombs and my opponent told me he couldn't even react to my serve. So Eric took a Zoom private lesson with me and we worked on his serve and what an amazing improvement. Congratulations, Eric, I'm so happy. I'm so, so happy to hear about that. Amazing, thank you for trusting me to help you with your game. That is awesome. Yeah, Eric, see the lower toss, it gives you less time to swing and that's one of the keys to hitting really great serves. See, players toss the ball super high and they think that's a good thing. They'll toss high and they think, oh, that'll give me a lot of time to swing, when really that's a problem. You wanna to toss lower and when you toss lower, that gives you less time to swing so you've gotta really move that racket quickly. So, Eric, that is awesome. Thank you so much for, for helping me out. Thank you so much, Maddie. By the way, we got 14 people on here and zero likes. Oh, I come on here sharing, sharing my heart with you in the, tennis, in the tennis world. Hello from Finland, love from India, that's amazing. Uh, greetings from Austria, this is so cool, look at this. How can you add more power when you serve? Okay, so think of it this way, easy math. Uh, that's right, distance over time, of course. Distance over time is the definition of speed, of course, yep. So when it comes to adding more power to your serve, there are a couple of things here. The first thing is you want to coil and uncoil. Look at that, we're up to three likes. Let's see if we can get 10 likes in the next 10 seconds. Go ahead, push the like button, 10, 10 more likes in 10 seconds. Here's how it works to get more racket speed or more power on your serve. Think coil, uncoil. So it looks like this, coil, uncoil. So that's step one. Don't think so much down and up. 
Don't think of the serve as like you just bend your knees and go up. You're better off just learning to coil and then uncoil. Yes, we want to go up during the uncoil, but turn your back to your opponent. If like you can see the green baseline right here, if I'm serving that way, coil and then uncoil. Try to turn your back to your opponent like you're going to get your chest to face the back fence and then uncoil. And that's what you see with J.J. Wolf. I'm always talking about J.J. and how great his technique is. And on his serve, he, he's only six feet tall and he can serve 136 miles an hour. It's unbelievable. Uh, so we want to make sure that we are coiling and uncoiling. Now, the next thing is the swing is built on the body. So once we understand that we want to turn the body and unturn, that we don't just keep our body facing forward, but that we want to turn our back to our opponent and then uncoil, the next thing we have to do is we have to use a circular swing. The swing shape is not go to your back and put your racket like this behind you. You don't want to do this. You want to do this. You want to create a circular swing, which is why I recommend, and keep writing your questions on there. I see people are typing stuff, and so I'll get you. I'm going to be here for, for probably about an hour. So I'm going to get to your question. Just keep typing them, and I'll get there. With the birthday hat, the nice thing about the birthday hat, if I'm serving against this wall, I want to coil and then toss, and if I toss low, that means I'm going to have to swing fast. But I'm better off having the, the um, birthday hat like a unicorn horn, and then when I look up, the unicorn horn is up, and then I knock the birthday hat off like this. Don't move your racket this way. That's not a powerful position. That's the trophy position that kills so many serves. What you want to get in is to this position, which is what Riley Opelka gets into when Federer lifts his racket up. Federer's racket is at shoulder level, and you could place a ball in the throat of the racket. Look at Riley Opelka's serve. When he lifts the racket up, it's like this. They don't start lifting the racket up like this. They lift it up, elbowing someone behind them with a ball in the throat of the racket. That gets the racket to circle around and knock off the birthday hat. So for the person who is asking, how do I get more power on the serve? Um, there, I could really talk about this for an hour, but let's just give you two ideas. Coil and uncoil and learn to use a circular swing that knocks off the party hat. All right, here, we got 20 here, that's good. Uh, my coach said you must toss the ball twice your arm length above. I completely disagree. Completely disagree. You only need to toss the ball uh, uh, like 15 to 20 inches out of your outstretched hand. Uh, we'll say 18 to 20 inches. Like you, you only have to toss out of your outstretched hand to the center of the racket. That's all you got to do. Look at JJ. Uh, brilliant. Thanks. You got it. Somebody asked, how do you hit deeper? How do you hit deeper? And thanks so much for hitting that like button. I appreciate it. We got eight likes now, which is awesome. Thank you so much. When you are looking to hit deeper, aim higher over the net. Hitting a little bit higher over the net will make the ball land deeper. Well, what do you do if your opponent keeps drop shotting every single point? Stand inside the baseline to, to rally against that person. Any dips on, uh, tips on dealing with a pusher that does nothing but lobs? Yes. Hit every return of serve as a drop shot and bring them up to the net. They won't like that. Uh, what would be a good tactic against someone who plays very good and deep slices? Sure, that's not really easy. What I would tell you is, what I always believe is, if you want to lower someone's level of play, raise their contact point. So people are usually good at hitting very deep and good deep, you know, cutting slices when they play the ball here or here. If you get them to play the ball here or here, their slice is not as good. So what I would tell you to, to kind of like hitting the ball deeper, I would tell you to hit higher over the net. And, they're, and when you hit the ball higher and deeper, they are not, like people are not going to hit slices on an on the rise ball. They're simply not going to. Uh, hit slices on an on-the-rise ball. So hit higher over the net. How difficult is it to change on the qualities of the ITF when you are a high-level player in your country, or do you not know anything about the tours? I know nothing about the tours. How, how difficult is it to get a, oh, a chance on the quality? I know nothing about the qualities. I know nothing about pro tennis and how to, make, how to do it. How should I crush short balls? Like, do I whip or roll or give a good placement? Uh, good, give a good placement. Don't crush it. Don't try to end the point with that shot. And, but stand farther away than you normally do. 
The number one mistake players make on the weak ball that's just sitting there is they stand too close to the ball. Remember, your arm is a radius. So as you raise your hand, your hand gets farther away. As you raise your racket, your racket gets farther away. So if the ball is right here, we tend to get jammed because we stand the same distance as if it's a low ball. What you have to understand is as the ball goes up to head level, you have to stand farther away from it to accommodate the fact that your arm and racket have to fit between you and the ball. Now, as the ball goes higher, it's now above you again. So a serve is basically 12 o'clock, a half volley is at six o'clock, head level is at three o'clock. So you gotta play the ball way away from you. So realize that people stand way too close to the ball and their shot really suffers. Are there drills to keep focus on the ball when hitting? I tend to look up and way too soon for ground strokes or even serve. Yeah, uh, I would absolutely just recommend hit the ball and never look up. Like just think shoulder to shoulder, put your chin on the front shoulder, put your chin on the back shoulder and just rally and learn what it's like to never look at the ball, ever. Just rally and wait till your shot goes over the net until you look. Any tips on how to make your serve, uh, your first serve 100% accurate? Um, no, nobody can do that. <laughs> you can't make 100% of your first serves unless you tap the ball really softly. Roger, Federer, like if you could hit 100% of your serves in, the pros would do it. You can't. You can, you can hit your first serve a little bit slower, which I would recommend. I would recommend you hit it more to the center of the box. I would recommend you add spin. Stop hitting flat serves, because when, when we're blasting flat serves, all we're doing is we're lowering our percentages, but we're not helping ourselves to win. When you're hitting faster serves, your opponent can just move back and just shorten their swing. So there are ways for them to negate your speed. So you're better off just curving, uh, curving the ball. I cannot aim with my forehand. It always goes down the line or to the right. Any idea how to fix it? Are you talking about, um, I would have to see your forehand, but it, obviously it sounds like you're late. And so there's one thing that people do all the time that makes them late. And it is they turn, they wait for the ball to bounce, and then they swing their racket. They turn their body, they hold their racket in front. When the ball bounces, then they swing. And that means they're waiting for the ball to bounce on their side to even begin the swing and they're late all the time. So try learning. And I actually, um, I can remember a woman I used to teach two years ago uh, at the tennis club where I used to coach. And I would ask her to swing twice. Now hear me out on this. For the person who said, I'm always late, can you help me? I she was always late as well. I would feed her the ball and I would ask her to turn, swing, then turn, and then hit the ball. She was always late, always feeling late, and I proved to her that she could take two swings, that she would actually circle and then hit the ball. I would, I, we'd be rallying, I'd feed her a ball, she would turn, swing, turn, and then swing. And it proved to her that she had time for two swings, so of course there's time for one swing. So you can work on getting the racket back, not fast, but early, those are two different concepts. There's a difference between driving fast to work and leaving your house early for work in the morning or school. Like there's a difference between those, but people mix them up and they think they're synonymous. They're not, they're not interchangeable. So try the moment the ball comes off your opponent's racket. So just use a continuous swing where you pay no attention to the bounce. You're only focused on being on contact or on time out in front. Would you make a 14-year-old change his forehand grip from a full Western to a semi-Western if his ambition is to reach pro tour? I don't care what his ambition is. Yes, get rid of the, get rid of the full Western. Sampras went from a two-handed backhand to a one-handed backhand when he was one of the best 12-year-olds in the US, and it turned out well for him. In my last 8-0 doubles league at net, I hit zero shots at the net against our opponents. They hit extreme cross court. Should I just move back I'm not comfortable in, uh, in that, in eye position. Yeah. TT warrior one. All right. So that's a problem with your partner. Your partner is staying back. And since your partner is staying back, that's their release valve. So you're at the net, but you can't do much because they're keeping the ball away from you. You got to get your partner up to the net or you got to go back to the baseline. One up, one back is the worst way to play doubles. You're better off playing both back or all the way both up. With you at the net, never getting the ball, it's two against one and you're just you're super frustrated and it's not fun. So either play with somebody who comes to the net or just get yourself back on the baseline because as you just said, one up, one back, it's not fun. Tips to return fast, strong, and low balls. 
Uh, let me look at here. It's not that I don't want to answer that. Uh, my coach told me that you should put the end of the racket handle on your hip when you're uh, winding back to your backhand. Is that good or bad? Uh, it's, it's not the best. You're talking about like this? to put the racket down there. It's not the worst thing in the world. You'd be better off keeping it up and then dropping around and swinging. I'm not a big fan of this, but you know, if, if, it's, if it was done as a mechanism of helping you to improve, I think it's good advice. Because I've had people do that. I've had people, uh, they struggle with the circular swing. And so I just told them to put the racket down here and then swing. So if you find that it helps you hit a backhand, then do that. Somebody asked a question about closed hands. Two and a backhands are almost always better with closed stance. Uh, Lisa, no. Um, so there is a backhand. I, I guess you, I think you said are almost always better. Yeah, I guess you could say almost. But there is one uh, time in particular, or two times in particular, that you're going to be better off with uh, an open stance. First off, if you're wondering when to use an open stance or a closed stance, it's all about the height of contact. Um, or it's, it's mainly driven by the height of contact. So low balls, forehand and backhand, are usually closed stance, neutral stance. High balls are usually open stance. That's backhand, forehand, it doesn't matter, right? Low balls are closed stance, high balls are open stance. But there is a situation where you're running hard to the side, right? So if I'm like this, if I'm running hard to my left, my last step is going to be with my left foot, and that's called a mobile stance because I go like this. So I'm running to my left. I step last with the foot that's on the side where I'm running. Since I'm running to my left, the last step is with my left foot. And then I go like this, drop step, crossover, split step. So high bowls, and when you're running fast to the side, you can use an open or a mogul. Is it better to try to hit a winner while returning a serve? Absolutely not. Return down the middle for consistency. Should I move in? or farther back for a kick serve return. I have a one handed backhand. You can do either. I've made video, uh, Cam does tennis. I have done uh, videos. In fact, it was funny. I made a video maybe two days ago, three days ago, I forget when it was. And I talked about a strategy of when your opponent tosses the ball, quickly moving back to give the ball a chance to drop and not letting your opponent see. And somebody wrote in the comments, wait a minute, like four months ago, you made a video and told us to move in and take it on the rise. You're right, there are more ways to skin a cat than just one, right? So you can do either. You can go in, take it off the rise, or you can move back. Especially as a one-hander, I would just recommend moving backward. I wouldn't recommend going forward um, because it's really tough to go in and take a kick serve on the rise because your opponent's kick serve might land a little shallow in the box. So you basically have to be up on the service line to take that ball on the rise, and then you're just doing a saber. Incredibly difficult. You're better off just standing much farther back and giving that ball room to drop. Uh, I saw your high, low, high video. My coach says, start your return with your racket low. I'm confused. Are you talking about the return? Because the return of serve, you can do this. On the return of serve, you can have your racket like this. So like I, I'm kind of here on the return of serve. I don't have the racket up and you don't have to make a big swing on the return. You can keep it more to the side and a little more compact. There is a circular nature to the return, but you can think of it as a little bit smaller. Why do I have so much trouble hitting high backhands? You probably will are not using an open stance. If you're using a closed stance, if you're using a closed stance on high backhands, that is gonna be really awkward. So get your left foot on the left, and then you'll be able to rotate. The higher the contact around head level, the more you've gotta be able to turn your hips. So that's why it's important that you use an open stance. An open stance makes it very easy to turn your hips. How do you handle people who use the drop shot lob combo? Oh, you drop shot. You drop shot a drop shot. So there are two shots you wanna copy. You lob a lob and you drop shot a drop shot. When your opponent lobs, you lob back. And if your opponent drop shots, you run, keep the racket in front of you, and you just gently dink the ball over the net. What's happening is you're running and you're hitting it deep and then they lob you. So you come in, you can do a little angle, and, and um, you drop shot, or you can just keep the ball in front of you. But drop shot a drop shot, learn to do that. I can't return a flat ball that skids along the play, or along the court, I'm sorry. A guy I was playing just kept hitting those forehands and I had no response. I can't return a flat ball that skids. Yeah, so what I would do is just, whether it's a forehand or backhand, is just use your volley grip, open up your racket and just chip it back. Open up your racket and chip it back. Don't crush it, don't try to hit topspin. If you have a Western grip, it's one of the reasons I don't like the Western grip. 
What is the difference in the forehand drop shot swings and forehand slice swings? Just a shorter movement and the racket face is more open on a drop shot. Uh, let's see here. At what, at what point do you tell your students to let's try one hand a backhand or it's almost always better to stay to it and play more slice? Uh, hey, what's up, Euros? Um, yeah, so uh, to me, when players struggle rotating their hips, um, if they're an older player, if they're maybe overweight, if, they, if they're not fast, these are all reasons to go one-hander. Uh, Two-handers need to be able to move fast. They've got to be able to rotate their hips. Um, it's, I usually say, if you're a good dancer, be a two-hander. If you're not a good dancer, be a one-hander. That is definitely not foolproof, but that's how it works. Good morning from Australia, uh, down the T. Good afternoon <laughs> here in the States. I'm about two hours from New York City. It is... Uh, 2.36 in the afternoon on Sunday. So good to know that the world will not end tomorrow because you're already there. When someone hits a powerful flat D backhand, how do you train to return? Racket angles, elbows out. So when the ball comes really fast to you, like on a return of serve, if your elbows are out, when you turn, the racket's gonna be next to you. Watch this. This is how you return fast serves. You get your elbows out. Now I know the USPTA, in fact, about two months ago, the USPTA put a video out on the way to return fast serves is to get your elbows in. They call it like lock and load or something. I, it was so stupid. You don't want your elbows in. When your elbow is in, that's when your racket goes too far back. When you push your elbow out, now your racket's like this. Watch this again. With your elbow in your, in your stomach, look where the racket goes. If I just push my elbow out, now my racket's here. The key to taking a small backswing is a, as elbows out. So whether it's a fast return of serve, or fast serve, I mean to say, whether it's a deep shot to your backhand, you want your elbows out when you turn, not your elbows in, because that takes the racket too far back. So elbows out, short backswing, super stable contact. What, the elbows out looks funny? I'd rather win and look funny than lose and look normal. When someone hits a powerful flat, oh, I already got that. And, and trust me, when people are, when you're winning, no one cares what you look like. Right? Just like, uh, what's his name? Medvedev. What do you do if your opponent uh, drop shot, then a lob? Like every time, I think I already did that. Let's go back to where we were with, I just blitzed through a lot of questions here. Let's go earlier on. Uh, forehand and backhand volley contact point. One of the reasons players struggle with their forehand and backhand volley is because they use a one grip system. I was just teaching this morning, I was teaching someone, uh, a woman in... South Korea, I gave her a Zoom lesson and she sent me video footage of her forehand ground stroke, her backhand ground stroke, her forehand volley, her backhand volley, and her overhead. <laughs> and in an hour we reviewed, hey, what's up Crunch Time Coaching? Guys, we got a celebrity here. Um, everyone make sure you're following Peter at Crunch Time Coaching. Uh, so I gave a Zoom lesson this morning. It was at 6 a.m. this morning. I was given a, a lesson to a woman, Peter, I was given a lesson to a, a woman uh, in South Korea. And Peter, you're probably not going to like this, what I'm about to say, but I do not teach the one grip system on the volleys. I think for recreational players, it really hurts their ability to hit great volleys. So what I teach is actually a two grip system. I do not teach use the same grip. And for all of you watching, if you're a coach, if you're a player, stop telling your students that they don't have enough time to change their grip because they do and you do. I've been doing, I, I, I'm not a pro tennis player. I was benchmark 5.0 by the UST or whatever that NTRP thing is. So that's the highest rating I got to was a 5.0 and I got benchmarked, which means I couldn't appeal it. And I just really stopped playing in my mid, it was actually like I was 22, I think when that happened. And I basically stopped playing because I had to travel to Princeton, New Jersey to be able to play on a team at their, at their club. And so I just stopped playing. But the idea that you use one grip system on a volley what you'll notice with the one grip system with like the two five, the three oh, the three fives, because some players just really have trouble getting up higher than that level and they kind of get stuck, is they end up hitting volleys that are forward on the forehand, but then they chop the heck out of the backhand. And so what I tell people is, look, you're not stuck using a one grip system. You have the time to change the grip. In fact, it takes less time to change the grip than it does to set the racket to the side and move the racket forward and step. So if you use a one grip system and you love your volleys, keep it. But I can tell you this, Bill Tilden 100 years ago would have, would, would, would have like lost his mind if he heard that people were using a two-handed backhand. 
right? A hundred years ago, he was like the champ, right? He was the best in the world, hundred years ago in tennis. And it was, oh, it's all one hand. I mean, heck, they used one, one grip for the forehand and the, they used one grip for every single shot. They used one grip. And look how tennis has changed. So yes, you can use a two-handed backhand volley or ground stroke and volley. Yes, you can change the grip slightly on the volleys. And when you change the grip, it helps square up the racket. So players will go forward on their forehand and then chop their racket down. And the coach will say, oh, we got to put the arm back. Or we got to build your strength. When all you need to do is just change the grip as you're turning slightly between a continental and an Eastern backhand, just a little bit. And then they square up the racket. I have had uh, so many players I have taught who have used a one grip system and they loved their forehand and backhand and I never changed a thing. I would never do that. It's like the birthday hat. If Pete's, like this is what people don't understand. And by the way, if I'm not sure if he's here, but crunch time coaching, you wanna talk about a perfect birthday hat serve? Uh, uh, Peter, if you're here, your serve is perfection of hitting the birthday hat. But if I were Shapovalov's coach, if I was Pete Sampras, I'm 44. Pete Sampras is my favorite player of all time, right? He doesn't hit the birthday hat, he's like this, and I would never force him to. I'm here, good, Peter, I'm glad you're still here. So the idea is, I like to give all of you options. And when, when players are saying, I'm struggling with my forehand and backhand volley, this woman this morning, she's been playing tennis for two years, um, she's 23, and she's one of my premium members of my website, twominutetennis.net. And when you sign up as a premium member for 40 bucks a month, you instantly get a Zoom private lesson with me uh, included. You get uh, uh, credit for one lesson. And she took it this morning with me and she said, Ryan, I can't hit a backhand volley to save my life. And she said, I've, I've practiced using the grip change and I love my backhand volley with the grip change, but the coach yells at me and says, no, it's gotta be with one grip. She says, I don't know what to do. And she said, he was like me, like yelling at her. I said, look, I don't know what to say, but you have the time to change your grip. And ultimately this is about you. Like this isn't about what the coach thinks. This is, the coach needs to worry about you, not what the coach wants to teach. Um, so for all of you, you can, I don't use a continental grip on either volley. I'm slightly to the right of it for a forehand and I'm slightly to the left of it for a backhand. Do I play pro tennis? No, but. Raven Clawson changes grips and he got to two Grand Slam finals and number ten, uh, top 10 in the world in doubles. Um, if you know who Raven Clawson is, uh, pro, you know, he beat the Bryan brothers. Uh, he learned from Steve Smith, who's down in Florida. It's all Vic Braden information. If a coach is yelling at an adult student, get another coach. Peter, I completely agree. Hey, Ryan, how do I deal with players who always lob the ball consistently? When I go for a smash, it usually forces an error, but I wait and try to hit the stroke. I often mistime it. Yeah, so one of the things you can do is you can realize which side your opponent lobs on uh, and which side they're, they're lobbing higher on and then avoid that side as you approach. So know that about your opponent. Another thing you can do is just let that ball bounce. I mean, 9.8 meters per second per second is a real killer. You know, as that ball is dropping, it is not easy to handle. But here's one thing I can give you that's gonna help you with your overhead for consistency. Stop hitting it hard and start applying spin. Spin is a tennis player's way of adding control. So if you want to add control on an overhead, add spin. What I tell people is hit side spin on all of your overheads because it's, this isn't about power anymore, right? We're, we're hitting serves from 15 feet from the net. We don't need to blast it 100 miles an hour now. And, and plus we get the whole court, not just the service box. So we can easily get this ball past our opponent. And second, if you are moving backward, then hit top spin. So if you're moving left, moving right, moving forward or stationary, hit side spin. But if you're moving backward, hit top spin. Let that ball maybe drop even a little bit farther and you roll up the back and you get top spin. Apply spin to your overhead and you'll have a more consistent overhead. So the way to handle that was to know which side your opponent is better at lobbing or the side that they hit higher and avoid that because if they're hitting it super high, what I recommend, um, for my students, if you want to really frustrate your opponent, learn to lob the ball for, and get it in the air for two and a half seconds by the time they contact. That seems like a short amount of time. You would be shocked how long that is. Most students, most tennis players cannot get the ball in the air for two and a half seconds. They just can't. It's, it's funny how it just, it just drops where, meaning um, the, the ability to get the ball up in the air. People can get it in the air for two seconds, 
but they cannot get it up high enough that it's in the air for two and a half seconds. That is a really, really high lob. So do that to your opponent. And for all of you watching, remember, we just had someone ask the question, how do I deal with these lobs? It's really hard to time. They're literally telling you the higher you lob, the more likely your opponent is going to hate it. That's why I teach height is more important than depth. There are two things that make a lob, height and depth. The, if you only, if the hierarchy is height. Height is always more important because it, the, the ability to lob and spin a ball right over your opponent's head, it's so few and far between. You're better off just forcing an error. We learned from Craig O'Shaughnessy that forcing an error is the most valuable way to win a point. When you're trying to hit a topspin lob and make it land behind them, you're avoiding your opponent. You don't need to avoid them unless they're Pete Sampras, Roger Feder, Peter Freeman, uh, Serena Williams. That's who you need to avoid. But if you're playing your buddy from down the street in a local league, just lob it up in the air as that ball accelerates. It passes through the window of opportunity to, to hit and they miss it all the time. All right, let's see what questions we got here. Hey, coach, I struggle with my doubles partner negativity. His constant complaining is very annoying. I try to stay positive, but his behavior never changes and it affects my game. I think we all know the answer to that question. <laughs> uh, you need to have a serious talk with that person and what you just said Y-O is exactly what you need to say to him. You say, look, I'm struggling with your negativity. You're constantly complaining and it's really annoying. I try to stay positive, but your behavior never ch changes and it's really affecting my game. So you need to say that to him. And if you can't say that to him, that's a problem, right? Like the, the key to any relationship is communication. You've got to be able to say that. If he's like, screw you, I'm out of here. You're like, oh, good. You know, good. Well, you, you, good. You broke up with me rather than me breaking up with you. But you got to, if, if if there's no chance in him changing, then you need to just pawn him off to someone else. You got to do everything you can to find another partner. How do I deal with players? Uh, wait, I already have that question. Uh, anything to make the game easy for our totally obsessed tennis players. I like that. That's how you always end your emails. Um, why my ball lands, uh, always lands on the net when I try to drop shot or if I did uh, pass the net, the guy gets a winner. Yeah, Rishi. Here's one of the problems with drop shots is we don't set up the drop shot. The drop shot, Rishi, is not a shot. It's not a singular shot. When you watch volleyball, aren't they trying to spike, right? but it's just not a bunch of spikes going back and forth. It's bump and set. So what I would ask you is, are you setting up the drop shot by pushing your opponent back? See, we all think, oh, I'm gonna work on my drop shot or what's the technique of a drop shot? And that's important, but wouldn't it be great if you could move your opponent back to the fence? There are ways to move your opponent back to the fence. Do you know why uh, Kyrgios is so good at hitting uh, an underhand serve? Do you know why Kyrgios is so good at hitting underhand serves? Because his opponents are standing 20 feet behind the baseline because he serves 142 miles an hour. So he started noticing, whoa, I could do an underhand serve because my opponents are standing so far back. Have you ever tried? I mean, like I'm 44, I can barely hit 105 anymore. My opponents aren't falling for an underhand serve because they're not standing very far back. But JJ Wolf, he could go for an underhand serve. Uh, Dr. Evo, he could go for an underhand serve because the opponents are standing so far back. So do that with the ground, do, the, do that with the drop shot. Learn how to push your opponent back, not necessarily with speed, but with height. Your opponents are not very good at hitting on the rise shots. It's just the truth. People don't like hitting the ball on the rise. I mean, Craig O'Shaughnessy told us that the number one way to force an error from your opponent is depth. Of all the ways, speed, taking time away from them, spin, height, left, right, whatever. Depth is the number one way to force an error from your opponent. Even on the, and that's on the pro tour. So it's definitely in our, you know, in our, at our level. So hit a higher ball, aim higher over the net than you normally do. That's going to push your opponent back. They probably will not lift it up. They'll probably hit really hard. You step inside the court and now your drop shot doesn't have to be so great. Now you're going to hit the net less and now they're not going to run that ball down and hit a winner. Uh, I think I'm fast guy, but I always have problem with fast start to the ball, something like stuck in the mud. Why is this happening? It's all about a split step. It's all about a split step. So if you have a topspin pro, you need to practice the split step with a topspin pro. Let me tilt this down. I take the shield off on the topspin pro so that I can take the arm off and work on serves, but I normally have the shield on. 
but you split step and then hit the ball. Split step and then hit. Split. You want to make that move every time. Split. Split. If you're not making that move, you're not going to have a fast first step. The split step is part breaking mechanism and it is part breaking inertia and making it so that you're not stuck and that you can kind of, when you land, you can explode to the ball. The proper timing on a split step is to be in the air as your opponent hits. And that is because there is a delay in our reaction time. And we need to, um, we need, I don't know, what's, what's the word? I can't believe I'm forgetting the word. Coincide, I, synchronize, thank you, there we go. Uh, we need to synchronize our brain and our reaction time with when our feet hit the ground. So if you land as your opponent's hitting the ball, you're gonna be stuck for about 0.2 seconds while your brain processes where the ball is going and now you're stuck and now it's gonna be slow. So it's not just enough to do a hop and to do a split step, you have to time it so that you're in the air as your opponent hits. So film yourself and see if when your opponent's hitting the ball, you are in the air. Watch the pros, that's when they split step. They do not land when the ball is hitting, uh, being hit. <laughs> Nori has no way to beat Alcaraz on clay. Zero chances. I agree. <clears throat> uh, always missing balls and supposed to attack. Uh, no, no man's land balls. Any help? Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things I always tell people is when you're playing a ball that's like easy and maybe it's a higher ball, you've got to stand really far away from that ball. Also, don't think of a short ball as a ball that you must end the point on. It's okay for your opponent to get that ball back. It's called a forcing shot. When you get a short ball, don't feel like you have to end the point with the shot that you're going to hit. It lends to missing too many shots because you're trying to hit a winner. Reduce the winners that you hit in a match and increase the forced errors and you're gonna win more matches. Coach, I'm having trouble dealing with high loopy uh, shots that land at the baseline. Uh, they're super fast and kick up over my head if I wait for the ball. I'm trying to get on the rise, but making errors. As I just mentioned, hitting deep forces people to make errors. The key to taking a ball on the rise is to do what I call crowd the bounce. So stand right where the ball's gonna bounce. And then you wanna match the height of the ball with your racket. So you turn and then as the ball is dropping, when the ball gets to here, you just match the, the, the ball. So you go down with the ball. You match it, you go down, the ball bounces, boom, you take it right off the bounce. So crowd the bounce and then drop the racket with the ball. <laughs> Thank you very much, you got it. My dream is to play tennis. It's possible to do starting at the age of 14. Anything is possible. Never let anyone, I feel like David Wheaton, David Wheaton was a player, uh, he was like a top 15-ish player, American, uh, when I was growing up. And I believe, look him up, look up his story, David Wheaton. I believe he started at the age of 10, 12, 14. Like, he was later. It's not like he was Djokovic starting super young. How do you use the wind in your favor? <laughs> it seems to mess up with my technique. You, you got to keep your feet moving and you have to aim for the center of the court. Realize if the wind is at your back, you got to aim lower over the net. And if the wind is coming at you, you got to aim higher over the net. You don't use it as, you don't use it to your advantage. You, using the wind to your advantage is very, very difficult. Uh, P.S. Your videos improve my tennis in a crazy way. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Thank you so much. How to improve, how to increase power in depth on your shots. Yeah, so one thing you can do is after you hit the ball, first off, depth comes from height and speed and spin. So the height over the net plus the speed you hit the ball plus the spin you put on the ball equals where the ball lands. People usually hit the ball way too low over the net, so then the ball lands short. So just to get more depth on your shots, just aim a little higher over the net. I'm not talking about 10 feet higher. I'm just talking about a foot or two higher. Just aim a little higher than you normally do and watch how the ball lands a little deeper than it normally does. But for power, one of the things you can do is really try to plow through like this. Is When, when you look at um, Taylor Fritz hit a backhand, when Fritz hits a backhand, he does not go like this and go over the shoulder. He actually hits and he stops in what I call the Jimmy Connors or Novak Djokovic position, which is the left side of the letter V. 
and they just explode out like this. So rotate and feel like you're handing your racket to your opponent rather than just being so whippy and short with a short contact zone, really compress the ball going forward and through and up and actually reach out and you'll feel a difference. Hit it a little higher than you normally do and really compress the ball low to high. Right? Like don't, don't be whippy, but actually really compress through the ball and you'll get a, a higher percentage of power allocated into the speed of the ball, not just the rotation and the RPM of the ball. How do I handle a lob which lands far behind me when I'm at the net waiting for a volley? You split step and you immediately turn and run. Put your head down and sprint. If it's gonna land way behind you, you're not even gonna worry about hitting an overhead. You split step, you turn, do a drop step, and you run. Don't even watch the ball. Your goal is like an outfielder in baseball. You see it go off the bat, you turn and run, and then you find it. So you just wanna kind of understand where it's going so that when you run, you're running to the side of it so the ball doesn't hit you because if it hits you, you lose the point. And then when the ball bounces, you'll kind of uh, keep track of where it is. And just remember when you run it back, you need to lob. Any, f hey Matthew, what's up? Any footwork tips for one-handed backhand? I always feel clumped and the ball is coming up on me even though mentally I think prepared early, but I always feel out of position. Well, let me tell you this, Matthew. One of the reasons why people get too close to the ball in their backhand is because their heel pad is off. Hey, what's up, Richard? Richard, you always write the nicest things on my videos. I really appreciate it. So see, see this heel pad? In fact, I use these two spots. I just wrote them with a marker. In fact, somebody, I was on Instagram Live uh, like this week sometime, and somebody said I should just get these two spots tattooed on my hand. I was like, that's a really good idea, and my wife would kill me if I did that. But here's the point. If you are returning, if you're uh, hitting a backhand and the heel pad is off the racket, what that does, which, which shows that you don't have a trigger finger, right, instead of like this, that actually produces a contact point that is too much in front of you. So maybe the reason why you are getting too close to the ball in your one-handed backhand is actually because you have a grip that puts the contact point in front of you. And if you stood correctly and put the ball over here, your racket would go over there. So you're actually learning to be in the way of the ball. So what I would do is I would make sure that your racket is at an angle in your hand. That gives you a trigger finger. And I know some pros do this. Great, let them do it. Some people are two-handers, some people are one-handers. You gotta have options and you gotta give people different ways to have success. So I would recommend really making sure that the racket is diagonally in your hand and then when you grab on that you have a trigger finger, that's gonna put the contact point off to the side because what dictates the contact point is when your strings face your target. And with no trigger finger, the contact point's here, which means when the ball is coming to you, and I'll, I'll show you this here. Let's say you're like, Ryan, I'm trying to stand over here so I'm away from the ball. Well, if you have no trigger and the heel pad's off, you're gonna have to stand here and then you're gonna get side spin, the ball's gonna curve, uh, the ball's gonna you know, spin like the, a Frisbee, so I would make sure that you have the grip. That's really the key to making sure that you can stay far enough away from the ball. Start with that, just make sure of that. What is your favorite racket? Uh, I love this. The, uh, the E-Zone 100, I love it. The V-Core is a little, I'm not a V-Core kind of guy, I'm not a pro staff kind of guy, I don't really like those rackets. How do I get more consistent while putting power into my forehand? Well, consistency comes from hitting the net less. So consistency comes from hitting the net less. The, there are four places to miss. Long, in the net, short, and, and uh, I'm sorry. Long, short, left, and right. So when you are playing, there are only four places you can miss. You can miss in the net, you can miss long, you can miss to the right, and you can miss to the left. Those are, that's how you're inconsistent. Let me move this back. That's how you're inconsistent. So do you know which one happens the most? This. Hitting the net is what, what causes people to be inconsistent. So aim higher over the net. You'll hit the net less, you'll hit deeper in the court, your opponent will then miss before you miss and then you win. Can you show a semi-western in your hand? Yes. Let's talk about all the grips. So whenever you talk about the racket, you always want the racket on its edge. Don't put the racket like this, put the racket like this. Have the racket on its edge, okay? We are looking at an octagon. If you are right-handed, 
What is the difference between an extreme Eastern and semi-Western? Good question. Extreme Eastern is what Agassiz used. All right, so check this out. This is panel number one. I call them panels because I have learned, especially with people from different you know, places and regions in the world and languages, that people don't know what a bevel is. People think that a bevel, uh, <laughs> opinion on Patrick Maratoglu, he is very energetic. So here's the, um, the, the, people think this is a bevel. This is not a bevel. This is a bevel. A bevel is a flat side. A bevel is not a corner. So I started calling them panels a couple years ago, and it seems to kind of clear up a lot of issues for people. So the top panel is number one. If you are right-handed, you count to the right to count the panels. If you're left-handed, you count to the left to count the panels. So let's talk about, somebody said, a semi-Western. A semi-Western is putting these two spots, the base knuckle of your index finger and your heel pad, on panel number four. That's this panel, this flat panel. If you're right-handed, that's one, two, three, four. If you are left-handed, it is one, two, three. This is your semi-Western. So I take those two spots and I place them on the fourth panel. Here's another way to think of it. When you have a semi-Western grip, your palm is up at 45 degrees when your racket is straight up and down. An Eastern back, I'm sorry, an Eastern forehand places the palm facing the, hey, what's up Bjorn? Did you change your name? So the strings facing forward has in, with my, with my palm facing forward, that's an Eastern forehand grip, right? When you change and you turn your palm 45 degrees and then you grab on, that's a semi-Western. If your palm faces up and you're on the very bottom panel, panel five, that is a full Western. If you're on three, that is an Eastern. So an extreme Eastern would be on the corner, on the corner, if, if you're right-handed, between panels three and four. Now the difference between the middle of three and the corner is 22 and a half degrees. How do we know that? I am no mathematician. Three, 360 degrees divided by eight, that's 45 degrees. Each panel is 45 degrees different than the next panel. Well, we're talking about a half a panel, which is a 16th of the grip. Each panel is one eighth of the grip because there are eight panels. We're talking about a half. So we're doing a half of 45, which is 22 and a half. So if you go from an Eastern to an extreme Eastern, you're changing your hand position 22 and a half degrees. If you go for, from an Eastern to a semi-Western, you are changing your grip 45 degrees. Uh, yes, Dimitrov uses extreme Eastern. Yeah, and like Fetter's low on that. What's the best way for a short guy, 5'6", to ha handle high bouncers? You've got to go all the way back to the fence or you've got to take it up on the rise. Uh, what do you recommend to start competing at tennis? Uh, find a local club, just simple Google search, local leagues in my area. How do I get more consistent while still putting power on my forehand? Just make sure that you're allocating enough racket speed. If you've got, you know, you've got a good forehand, make sure you're allocating enough racket speed into spinning the ball. Spin is a tennis player's way of producing control. Just like, you know, bend it like Beckham. If you're playing billiards and you put English on the cue ball, Baseball pitchers, football quarterbacks, go Eagles, you know, they throw a spiral. Spin is the way players who use a ball in sports, it's the way they control the ball. So you got to make sure that you're adding enough spin. Is there a difference in serve and smash? The serve, where should, uh, where should the contact point be? Okay, so on an overhead, the contact can be anywhere. It could be a little bit out in front. It could be way behind you. It, it could be a little bit off to the right. That's because you're not the one in control of the toss. You got it, Tiger. You're not in control of the toss. That's why it's so important that you add spin. So I mentioned this a couple minutes ago, but I want to reiterate this. Stop hitting overhead so hard and instead place your overhead by adding spin. So if you're standing still or moving forward or to the side, use side spin. If you're moving backward, use top spin and spin the ball going up the back of the ball. How best to help players who get sucked into opponent's game style during matches? Daniel, that's a great question. 
So let me take that question a little bit further. Here's often what I hear when somebody asks that question. What I ask, when I hear that is, how do I get my student to stop being a pusher because their opponent is a pusher? See, if your opponent's a servant volleyer, that doesn't suck you into servant, serving and volleying. If your opponent's an aggressive baseliner, that doesn't always push you into being an aggressive baseliner. If we take that question kind of to the end, what typically happens is uh, the opponent is a pusher, they're hitting super slowly, they're nervous, so then my, my student is super uh, a nervous and a pusher and they're not being aggressive. One of the best way to, ways to do that is to get your opponent off the baseline. So when your opponent, when the opponent hits a second serve, hit a drop shot. Not because the, you're trying to win the point, but you're just hitting a short ball, not to end the point. So don't just start missing and hemorrhaging points for no reason, but hit a short ball to bring them up. Pushers and people who, grinders who just wanna push the ball over the net super high, they hate coming to the net. If they like coming to the net, they would come to the net. The fact that they're not coming to the net means they don't wanna to come to the net. And if you hit short on purpose, that brings them in, and then you just make the ball go right to them. All right, Richard, I think you asked a question. So I'm gonna go up. Sorry, I, see, I get so many questions. So Richard, I'm gonna go all the way up. Double-handed backhand count left and right. I'm, uh, are you talking about two-handed forehand and two-handed backhand? You can do that if that's what you're asking. What is your opinion on the Swing Vision app? Incredible. It's one of the ways that I communicate with my students. Um, so I do Zoom lessons. So I have players who every, all around the world, everybody, thank you, Daniel, all around the world, I teach people. Just this morning, I taught a woman in, uh, uh, in South Korea. She was my 6 a.m. lesson. I woke up at 5.15 this morning um, to give a lesson to a woman in South uh, Korea. And uh, so I teach people all around the world, Dubai, Germany, Switzerland. Uh, I have a lesson with a guy in Australia next week, all over the U.S. And one of the ways that they communicate with me and give me videos of them playing is through the Swing Vision app. So here's what's really cool. You go to twominutetennis.net, you become a premium member for 40 bucks a month. You get four classes a week, group classes. We, we're building an amazing community of players. Uh, we go over different topics, but as soon as you sign up for a premium membership for twominutetennis.net, you then get uh, credited for, you get credit for one free Zoom private lesson. And then since you're a member, you get half price in anything else that you purchase as a member. Um, and it drops the price from one, uh, 120 down to 60. And I give, match play analysis lessons. If you're speaking a different language, I have no idea what you're asking. <laughs> I speak English, barely. Um, so when I teach people with stroke, I'm sorry, uh, match play analysis, they send me videos or say, hey, Ryan, here's the link to my swing vision. Can you analyze this set for me and tell me the strategies and the footworks and the tactics and the core positions and, and, and my shot selection and, and what I could have done differently to win? And I just sit there and I, I screen record points that I want to show the person. We meet live on Zoom. It's the best freaking tennis lesson you'll ever take. It, I mean, it's 10 times better than an in-person lesson. Zoom lessons, they, they put to shame in-person lessons because in per I do not speak French. <laughs> no, no. Is, is the French word for no, no? Because if it is, then I speak one word of French. Otherwise, no. So... If you would like me to personally sit with you on Zoom, share my screen, because on Zoom you can share your screen, right? And you see yourself, I see you, you see me, you're asking me questions, I'm demonstrating stuff with you, and I'm teaching you how to start winning these matches. I'm telling you, Zoom lessons are absolutely incredible, and the Swing Vision app is the way I communicate with my students so that they can send me videos of their match play, and I can help them win more matches. What's the best strategy against people who like to lob? If you're going to the net, Keith, stop at the service line. You don't want to rush the net just to lose at a faster rate. So if you're hitting an approach shot and you're going forward, you don't want to be going like this. So stop on the service line and split step. Or if you hate overheads, then stop going to the net altogether and bringing, bring them up to net. All right, guys, I got about five minutes left. I really like to improve my tennis, but here in India, tennis is not recognized much and we even do not have many courts. Uh, very few, uh, to in a uh, very poor shape. Rishi, I would love to help you out. So I can be your internet coach. 
Any tips on how to stop hitting the net on second serves? Yes, keep your, keep your body sideways and your chest up. Another thing you can do, who asked that question? Josh, here's another thing you can do. I know this seems really funny, but this works. I want you to cross your wrists as you're hitting the ball. And I'm not joking you. I want you to feel, I want you to feel like as you're hitting, you're crossing your wrists and then bring your arms down in an X. A lot of times people on a second serve, they open up and bend their back. If I'm serving against that wall, keep your chest to the side and up and keep your left arm if you're right-handed. Keep your tossing arm up and then don't bring that arm down until you hit it with your hitting hand. I promise you, you will hit the net less, guaranteed. Yeah, you got it, Keith. I've been told that I'm tensed while playing. How do I stay relaxed while still very alert? For me personally, the more I talk, the more tense I was. So like a running dialogue or monologue, I guess it would be, <laughs> going on in my head. Uh, so I would recommend not talking. Sing a song, focus on your breathing, take your hand. Like a lot of people, they just squeeze onto the racket. In between points, they just walk around. I've seen men and women, players, they don't let go of their racket for two hours. They're just death gripping. After the point, relax. Relax your hand, hold on to the racket like this, relax this hand, feet moving, clear your mind, look at your strings, just, just anything you can do to clear your mind. The more you talk, generally the more tense you're gonna be. When you drop shot, should you go to the net after? Yes, you wanna go forward. Well, you only wanna go forward if your opponent's gonna be below net level when they get there. If you hit a drop shot and you accidentally put a little too much air under it and they're gonna come up like this and they're gonna play the ball above net level, then you gotta stay back. What are your opinion on the Tennis Brothers? I don't really watch a lot of their stuff. I've watched maybe one or two of their videos. I don't really watch other creators. It's kinda of like if you own an Italian restaurant in New York City, you're not dining out at other Italian restaurants every night. <laughs> like I don't have time to, to just sit around and watch uh, other people's channels. My daughter plays really pro in uh, training much, three, six in France, I'm not sure, but loses all. Uh, sorry, I'm not, I'm, I, sometimes I have trouble uh, understanding uh, the questions. What is the correct form for a backhand slice? Nicole, great question, Nicole. All right, so here's one issue that comes with a slice backhand. Uh, and real quick, I'm gonna answer that question in just a second. Uh, just for everyone, just give me 10 seconds and I'm gonna give you real keys that are gonna help you with your slice backhand. If you would like me to personally fix your serve, your forehand, your backhand, your neck game, your footwork, your strategy, go to twominutetennis.net. I'm actually running a sale until tomorrow night, Monday night, um, and the sale is Zoom private lessons where you send me video footage of your serve or your forehand, your backhand, any stroke, or match play, or your footwork, or whatever and I come onto a Zoom call with you live. I see you, you see me, we're talking, I'm answering your questions, you're demonstrating in your house, it's not on court. You send me video footage of you playing, and I analyze it before our lesson, and I write down all my notes, and I sit with you for an hour, and I teach you step by step exactly how to improve your confidence and, and win more matches. They are the most incredible lessons, they're on sale right now. If you would like me to continually help you with your game, then get the premium membership. It's 40 bucks a month. It comes with a free Zoom private lesson with it. You also get a weekly live call with me uh, on Wednesdays, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you can't make the class, no problem. I have people around the world who cannot make the class and they get the recording of it uh, within 48 hours. Uh, just an incredible, incredible value with the Zoom private lessons. So I would love to coach all of you. Go to twominutetennis.net and I will personally work with you one-on-one -on -one throughout the week at a time that's convenient for you to improve your game. Here is how you can improve your slice backhand. First off, just understand, remember PEMDAS, right? Remember PEMDAS in math, uh, order of operations? The order of operations in tennis is grip, body, swing. And on the serve, it's grip, body, toss, swing. That is the order in which you want to check to see what you're doing to make sure that it is correct. And the reason is because the swing is built on the grip and the body. Grip, body, swing. If you are a coach and you have not checked your student's grip, nor have you checked the body movements, and you're just going straight to the swing, that is causing real issues. So here's a question that I have for everyone. What angle on a slice backhand, what angle is the racket going to be at contact? I actually talked about this yesterday in my live. 
should the racket be straight up and down, so we're gonna call this zero, okay? Because this is like zero degrees open. Should the racket be straight up and down on a slice? Should it be 10 degrees, 20 degrees, 30 degrees, 40 degrees, 45, 50, blah, 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 or 90? When you contact a slice ball, what angle should the racket be at the exact moment you make contact? Because this sets the stage for all the success that you're gonna have with your uh, slice backhand and all the struggles you're gonna have with your slice backhand. So we got Richard saying nearly vertical. I'm gonna get maybe 10 people to answer here, 85 degrees. So Chris is talking about 85 degrees, which means it's five degrees off of straight across. So Patrick said 10 degrees, all right? So we've got someone saying nearly vertical. We got 10 degrees and we got 85 degrees at contact. Let's keep going here. I want a couple more uh, guesses. I want a couple more guesses because this really, this really lets us know. In fact, who asked the question about the slice? Where is, somebody asked that question. Nicole, I wanna see if Nicole's even gonna answer it. No more answers? Okay, uh, sorry, I meant five. Okay, there you go, Chris. Chris is saying five degrees open. Uh, seven, Nicole said 70 degrees open. So that's about like this, okay? Uh, 12 degrees, depends on the height. Hmm, look at like the overachiever teacher's pet here. You're 100% right, it does, con it does matter the height of contact. 60 degrees, so Matthew is saying here, uh, between 50 and 60, yep, yeah, like this. The answer is straight up and down to 10 degrees open. That's it. When you hit a, for all of you golfers out there, if you have a club that is open 60 degrees, like a 60 degree lob wedge, does the ball go forward off the club? I mean, only if you, you, you tow it. The ball goes up off your racket. You got it, sweet and dandy. Yeah, you're, you're always on here, so you're, that's cheating. You're not supposed to know the answers when you take a test. Oh wait, I guess you are supposed to. When you hit a slice backhand, you want the racket to be nearly straight up and down at contact. When you contact high, you want it very straight up and down. When it's lower, that's when it can be open as much as 10 degrees when it's low. And I'm not talking about when it's a lob. I and mean, when it's a lob, you can just have it as open as you want and just hit that ball way up in the air. What can we, here's a, a test for all of you. What can we as tennis players use as the way to alter the angle of the racket? Do you, do you know? See, in golf, they have all of these clubs in their bag. You know, so they're like, hey, what do you think? Should, is this a four iron? And like, I don't think, I think that's too much club. I think you got to hit a five. Maybe, you know, maybe, you know, or, or yeah, maybe a, a, a five, a strong five is what you want, blah, 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 right? What can we as tennis players use in order to alter the racket angle at contact? Because if you're currently like this, and I'm not surprised because Nicole asked that question, Nicole is having trouble with her slice backhand. And she's, she asked... There you go, Richard, there you go. She asked, hey, what's the proper form in a slice backhand? And then I knew to ask, how did I know to ask the question? How did I know to ask the question? And the answer was 70 degrees from the person who was struggling with the slice. Now, we're saying wrists, but here's the thing. You don't have to move the wrist. You can just change the grip. The continental grip for players, some players love the continental grip on their slice. But when you're a coach, you can't just say, hey, it's the slice, hey, it's the slice. And she's like, I don't, I don't like the wrist position. I don't like bowing my wrist to get that racket over. I like my wrist position the way it is. Then you change the grip a little bit farther than you normally do. So Nicole, what I want you to do on the slice, what I want you to do, because right now, if your racket face is open at 70 degrees when you strike the ball, that ball has tons of backspin, tons of slice, it floats up in the air, it's super slow, and the ball just stops, right? Uh, what days do you go live? I go live during the week on Instagram around 3 p.m., 3 in the afternoon, New York City time, because I'm picking up my kids from school, and then I'm gonna try to go live uh, on the weekends when I get a chance to, all right? So I'll, you just, I don't schedule them, I just figure out a time that's kind of convenient for myself and my wife and my kids, so. Uh, so yeah, just keep your notifications on. That's gonna let you know to keep your notifications on. So here's what I want you to do, do, Nicole. I want you to change your grip a little bit farther than you normally do. Then when you go to hit the slice, have your racket straight up and down when you strike the ball. Now, 
Here's another thing for all of you on the slice backhand. Don't think of the slice backhand as a one-hander. Think of the slice backhand as a one-and-a-half-hander, and let me explain. Instead of turning for your slice and then letting go and hitting, which when you do that, the racket, because the racket weighs something, it wants to stay where it is, so it lags, and then the racket can be open, and you can't, like, supinate to get that racket to be square against the back of the ball. Do what Dominic Team does. Bring the racket like this with both hands initially. So almost feel like you're gonna hit the ball with still half a hand on the racket, then move your hands apart. So move both hands toward the ball, down from up here to low, so it's high, medium, high, right? It's, you're gonna draw a canoe, or like a bow in a bow and arrow, or a smile in a smiley face. It's high, medium, high, but move your hand forward and then back, your non-hitting hand, forward and then back. So it goes forward and then back. That'll make sure that you are actually using your back arm as a counterweight. What players do with their slice is they let go too early and then they open up because they did this too early. So then when they get to the ball, this energy has dissipated. It's no longer a counterweight because it's not doing anything. And then it gets yanked forward. So what I want you to do is change your grip, your grip a little bit farther than you normally do for your slice backhand. If you're struggling with your slice backhand and you're struggling because the racket's open and you chip it too much, Go to the ball, go to the ball, then let go just before contact, then move your arms apart and, you know, pinch your shoulder blades together. Thank you all so, so much. I really appreciate it. We got 67 people on here. This is so exciting. Uh, I'm going to be done now. I really, we went 66 minutes. This is amazing. 66 minutes. We got 67 people. Maybe I should stay on for a thousand minutes. Maybe we'll get a thousand people. Um... If you have any questions, please just send me an email, ryan at twominutetennis.net, or just go to Two Minute Tennis. Uh, very well explained. You got it, Nicole. I'm happy to help. I love coaching tennis. Anonymous YouTuber, you just got here. I've been on here for over an hour. Darn it. You got it, Richard. Richard, again, you, you have said such amazing things, uh, supportive things in the comment section on YouTube. Uh, please realize I'm a real person. <laughs> um, so nice things said to me mean a lot. So thank you. <laughs> we, we tend to think that the people who we see maybe on a screen aren't real people, but I, I'm in a, about an hour, I'm going to be starting dinner and cooking dinner with my wife. It's actually one of my favorite things to do is cook dinner with my wife. Um, but yeah, I'm a real person. So thank you for the compliments and the, con and the, and the, uh, the comments. If you would like me, you, hey, thank you so much. If you'd like me to help you personally improve your tennis game, go to twominutetennis.net and book, you got it, Tina, book a Zoom private lesson. You can work one-on-one -on -one with me right now. Go to twominutetennis.net and you can book an hour lesson with me. It's on sale. It's normally $120 for an hour. It's $76. And if you're a premium member, you get to cut that in half and it's $38 to be one-on-one -on -one live with me while I am working on your technique showing you videos of you hitting serves, backhands. Again, just this morning, I taught a woman in uh, uh, South Korea and I, we worked on video of, we looked at video of her forehand, backhand, forehand volley, backhand volley, and overhead. In an hour, we went over five shots. It was so cool. So thanks so much. Hey, thanks, Ben. Sorry that you just got here. I gotta go though. I've been here, on here for 68 minutes. Thanks again, and if any of you have Instagram, I'm always live on Instagram at 3 p.m. New York City time. Three in the afternoon, New York City time for about a half an hour, but I'll be in my car because I'm waiting to pick up my kids at school. Have a good one, and you got this.